I like to play with the algorithms. So I play with different clicks to see what's going to happen. And at one point, you get a, an ad. Oh, you're unhappy with your life. You're a data scientist. You studied to do artificial intelligence and you're not doing what you want. And look at me. I am now self-employed and I have five employees. So it's smarter than us and it's driving conception, clickbaits. It's 10 times smarter than us. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Artists of Data Science podcast, the only self-development podcast for data scientists. You're going to learn from and be inspired by the people, ideas, and conversations that will encourage creativity and innovation in yourself so that you can do the same for others. I also host Open Office Hours. You can register to attend by going to bitly.com forward slash a D S O H. I look forward to seeing you all there. Let's ride this beat out into another awesome episode. And don't forget to subscribe to the show and leave a five star review. Our guest today is an artificial intelligence specialist, designer, author, and developer of three cutting-edge artificial intelligence solutions. He began his career authoring one of the first AI cognitive natural language processing chatbots applied as a language teacher for Moet, Ishandan, and other companies. He's also authored an AI resource optimizer for IBM and apparel producers. And if that isn't impressive enough already, He's also authored an advanced planning and scheduling solution that is used worldwide. He's an expert in explainable AI, and today he's here to talk to us about how to explore machine learning model results, review key influencing variables and variable relationships, detect and handle bias, and other ethical issues. So please help me in welcoming our guest today, author of several books, including Hands-On Explainable AI with Python, Dennis Rothman. Dennis, thank you so much for taking time out of schedule to be on the show today. I really appreciate you being here. Well, thank you for the presentation. Now I don't know where to hide myself. <laughs> <laughs> no hiding now, Dennis. You are on the Artist of Data Science podcast. Everything will be exposed. So let's, 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 <laughs> let's talk about, just tell us a little bit about where you grew up and what was it like there? Okay, so I was uh, born in uh, Berlin, Germany. My father was a Russian Jew. He was born in Russia. Then he immigrated to the United States. Then he became uh, American. And then he entered, because I'm, I'm a lot old, older than you, he entered the U.S. Army and he landed in Normandy in June 1944. So my father was uh, a World War II veteran. He was in the 3rd uh, Patton Division and he followed Patton all the way to uh, Berlin. And then uh, after the war, he chased Nazis for around two and half years and he was in the Dachau trials. As, okay, so that's uh, that's one path. And then on the other path, my mother is a Sicilian Catholic. She was born in Sicily, so she has nothing to do with the Jewish religion. So she was born in uh, Sicily and her family immigrated to France because of the famine. My father immigrated to the United States because of the persecution. They were literally killing people in his village when he left. So when my father freed the city, a city in the east of Paris, that's where he met my mother, who was a young Italian, smiling all the time. And he said, why would I marry you know, a Jewish person? I want to marry someone that's smiling all the time. I like this Italian Catholic. She won't speak religion to me anymore. And I have to think about that. So they, after the war and after chasing Nazis for some time, he entered NATO as a lawyer in Berlin. And that's where I was born. So basically, I spent my childhood uh, there. And then my father moved up in uh, the chain of command. Uh, he, he was in the army. Uh, and then he became a civilian. But he, he moved up. So we moved up to headquarters. And I traveled a bit around. And we ended up somewhere in France and northeast of France in the headquarters. So 
I was still in American school, so I didn't know anything about French people. And then my father said, why don't we retire at exactly the same place where we met? They met in a dance in the ballroom. So they moved and he built a house right across the street from where my grandparents lived. And so I had to learn French when I was around 14, 15, and I had to go to French school. But I had this American background and I had these five nationalities turning in my head, you know, Russian, Italian, German, French. Okay, so so American. So basically, my dream was a bit like uh, your map behind you when I was 15. I was thinking, I want to discover the world. I don't want to be, I don't want to be part of, too much part of one country or believe in one religion. I just want to, I want to understand everything that's going on in the world. So I was like you. I spent a lot of time looking at maps and I decided by the age of 25, that's where I want to go. So I wanted to go to Africa. I wanted to go to India because India for me was one of the, the hearts of our of our culture. And then I wanted to go to China. I wanted to go to Japan. I wanted to go to Hawaii and surf because when I was younger, I could surf on waves. And then now I can surf in my bathtub. And then after I wanted to go right through the United States. And actually I did all that by the age of of 25. That is super, super interesting. Now, my dream was to go to the Sorbonne, the University of Sorbonne in Paris, because I was reading these books and there was all these, this intellectual life uh, going on at the Sorbonne at the time. There were a lot of, there was a revolution in 1968. And I went to this university where the president said, you know, there's not many people that get master degrees in your generation. So I don't want you to come to my university to just learn a degree. I want you to go learn different degrees. If you go into English, I want you to go see language. I want you to go see history. So he had us musicology. He had us move around the university. We would major in one field. And then after that, I, I was one of the first teachers of computer science in, uh, at the Sorbonne. At the same time, I was becoming self-employed. So now you have, the, you have about the picture. And I met my wife in France, which is why I'm living in France. Otherwise, I'd still be moving around probably somewhere. <laughs> That's super, super interesting, man. There's so much there that I want to touch on. Um, where should I start? Let's see. I think the first thing I really found interesting well, the first thing I want to touch on rather is this idea that when you went to school, they had you major, not major in studying just one thing, but diversify your experience across a wide number of domains. How important do you think it is for data scientists and machine learning practitioners to do this type of, let's call it an apprenticeship for themselves, to not focus solely entirely on just math and data science, but to expose themselves to a number of different topics? Well, I'll be pretty brutal. Someone that doesn't do that doesn't can't emerge in artificial intelligence. <laughs> what are we talking about? Today, artificial intelligence algorithms go through billions of pieces of data on social media in every field, every single field. So if you're just stuck in your math, I don't see how you can even understand the data you're processing. Because at one point, you can do your math. But you're going to have to go to the data on one side. So you have your data here, then you have your algorithm. But the other side, you're going to have to watch your output. What do you, what do you want to output? So if you don't understand people, you don't like people, you don't like civilizations, and you have a problem with people that believe or don't believe, or you have a problem with Muslims, or you have a problem with Jews, or you have a problem with Christians, you're not going to go anywhere. You have to understand everything. If you want to match modern AI, you have to try to match their algorithms. And the algorithms are agnostic. They just go through everything. So if you don't know how your body, you have to have minimum culture. Or you can get a job but it won't be creative. You'll just, you know, it'll just do what you're told. Uh, if you want to emerge, well, then you have to, you have to, you have to open your eyes and you have to open your eyes to everything. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. Like that, that resonates with me so much. I've got a network of 2,500 something mentees through data science dream job. And a lot of these students are, or mentees rather, are aspiring data scientists or they're transitioning into data science. And they might think to themselves like, no, I just got to focus on only this math stuff. I got to focus on only, you know, Python and coding and this, this and that. Once I get into the industry, once I have a job, then I could study all these other different <laughs> topics, right? But you can't really, you're going to set yourself up for a whole world of misery if you do that. And you just won't be as world smart, right? Like you 
you're mentioning, you need to have knowledge of you know, global context in order to make. Yeah, the, yeah. Well, let, let me say something about the yeah, math. Yeah, please, please. The level of math and artificial intelligence is so low. I don't see how someone who's going to spend a lot of time in mathematics. We're not talking about field medalists uh, in mathematics. So people are mixing up these very. If you have like I would say, let's say uh, two years of college of calculus and math, that's that's enough. We're not doing math research. In fact, these equations live by themselves. So basically, if you can have a small equation, of course, they look, for someone that doesn't know math, it looks very complex, but it's very simple math. You take this to a mathematician researcher, he would say, come on, Dennis, what are, what are you talking about? So it's not about math. Math is the tool. It's like someone who's trying to build a house with a hammer. So you say, I have a hammer and I have a screwdriver and I'm going to build a house. But where are your ideas? Where's the blueprint? What are you creating? So in Python, you can learn Python in one day. I've developed in C++, Java, PHP, whatever. It takes, one, it takes one day to get your code and then you have everything on the internet to help you. So you need to look at somewhere else. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. 100% agree with your viewpoint. And I think that this air of superiority with people out there on LinkedIn posting these, oh, you're not a real data scientist if you don't, dot, dot, dot. I think that's just so detrimental to the field and just, I'm not I'm not a fan of that type of mentality, right? Um, yeah, like you mentioned, you don't need to know the ins and outs of every single thing in order to get something up and running and working to help facilitate a decision. So another thing I wanted to touch on was you mentioned that you had these five identities swirling around in your head. I think that's really interesting. You know, you're kind of developing yourself as a very cosmopolitan type of person. What impact do you think that had on your choice to then go into studying artificial intelligence? Well, it was everything, right? Because it seems nice now, but when you're a child, like when I was a child, I was speaking German and English, and I was observing German people and Americans, because basically that's where I was in Berlin. The German people I were, I, I, I like the woman would take care of me after school, was the wife of a Nazi, because they're all, I, I, was, in, I was there in the 1950s. So basically, my experience there was post-German Nazis or people that believed in Hitler, but then were disappointed, obviously, and were trying to live another life. That was my first contact. When you come from a Jewish Catholic family and a father who fought the war freed extermination camps, and then he says, I'm going to hire a German and she's going to take care of you. So that was, I would say to my father, why do you do that? He said, the war is over. You know, people, people that fight wars after the war aren't soldiers because once you fight a war, you don't want to hear about it anymore. You want to go dancing, you're going to eating, it's over. So that was mind opener. So you get, you know, it's like a can. You have a lot of cans and you open a can. So that was my can of beans, can of, of corn. So, and I remember this lady taught me how to draw. So that was one perspective. And she was always drawing these very colorful things because she was trying to forget the war. So then in American school, then I was learning competition. Americans are very competitive. So we had sports compete, 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 get the best grades. Who's the first grade? Who gets the best grade? Best. So here you have these competitive world. So I was thinking, whoa, 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 whoa. So I would say about age seven or eight, I was already analyzing the way people were thinking to adapt to each one of them. So I was in American school, but I was talking to Germans at the same time. So I had to figure out some abstract model, which would enable me to adapt to both. And then, you know, to fast forward, otherwise you're going to fall asleep. Then, <laughs> then I would go on vacation to my grandparents' house, which were Italian. My grandparents on the Russian side were dead. A lot of people were killed on the way. We're not going to go into this victim thing. So back in my Italian, oh, this was always joyful. Like uh, my grandmother would always be happy. And I said, what do you have? And she says, we have nothing. I said, you have nothing? Nope, no money, nothing. So why are you happy? Because I'm in good health and I'm going to serve you some spaghetti. And grandpa is going to sing you some Italian songs. My grandfather was a bricklayer. He was late, but he was always drinking good wine. He was the real Italian singing. And I said, how are you so happy? He said, well, I, did, I, did, I went in World War I. One, I received a bomb. It bombed all the part of my body. You can see that my leg can't move. I'm alive. I'm alive. We have food. So if you have food on the table and there's good wine, let's sing, let's have fun. So then I said, whoa, why had to step back again? And I had to integrate all that and now to get in a more abstract model where I could adapt again. 
And then at some times when I, I got to uh, be, a, when I was a teenager, then I got into French school. French school in the 1970s is, well, these are intellectuals. You know, uh, French people like to think a lot. They don't do a lot, but they think a lot. And they think so much, then, then what they do is pretty good, like Airbus and stuff like that. So, you're talking to intellectuals like I'd never seen. I would read my comic books. I would have my baseball cards. And all of a sudden, I see these people around me. They're 15, 16. They're reading this literature like I've never even heard the names of. So I got this incredible perspective of philosophy. And they would study German philosophy, too, in France, because these are countries that are very close, in fact, culturally. So I got into philosophy. And then I had to be able to build an even bigger model. So by the time I got to the Sorbonne, where you have, like, like 50 nationalities, you know, in your class around you, I was beginning to be able to change all the time. And in France, there are a lot of Muslims. So I was trying to figure out how I could put uh, the Jewish religion, Catholic, Christian, Muslim all together. And then I had this stuff at the Sorbonne with Buddhism and Hinduism. And then I saw Zen Buddhism and I saw Shintoism. And I say, how can I create a model where I don't have to think too much when I talk to each of them? So I found these common, I found common concepts in all these religions is like good behavior, respect something that's above you. I could say even with these two tools, you can make it in any religion. You can say there's something that's always higher than us that we have to respect and we should behave pretty well. Otherwise, we can't live in society. So if you take these two things, you can go through all the religions. You can also go through all the cultures. So I begin to navigate and, you know, uh, little by little, uh, I was very good in linguistics. So immediately, as soon as I saw the first computer processor, I began to try. I didn't, there weren't, there wasn't even a screen on. I'm talking about 1981. There wasn't even a screen. So you had this processor. You had to connect to your TV screen. There was no mouse, no nothing, no window, and you had practically no memory. And I began typing math and I say, could I make a concept that would generalize, you know, the stuff I'm thinking about? So it's just survival, you know, adapt, to adapt. That is really, really, really fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing that. It definitely did not put me to sleep. I think it's, I can't help but every time I, I've done maybe 70 of these interviews so far, and it's always fascinating to me. Like, here's another person on the other side of this screen with their own set of unique experiences, their own journey into where they are right now. And it's just always so fascinating to, to me just to imagine all the things that you have seen coming up, you know, to where you are now. So I, I love hearing these stories. Thank you so much for sharing that. Sure. That was really, really fascinating. So you've been in the AI game for quite some time. So oh, I started uh, modelizing uh, statistics in 1978. So how much more hyped has the field become since then until now? You mean what, what has changed? Well, I guess like how much more widely adopted has it become from the... Yeah, you're, you're right. In 1978... I remember I would take like uh, the New York Times or Washington Post, and then I would take all the words, the main words, and convert them into numbers, to vectors, and then figure out, you know, how could I summarize everything with these numbers? Because I was confronted with all these cultures and languages. I say, why? I, I began to write everything in math as a, a teenager, in fact. In fact, when my children go and look at my books, because I write in all my books, I translate my books as I go along into mathematical functions. So they, I remember I said, saying, why are you writing mathematical functions in all the books? Every time I borrow a book for you, it's full of that scribbling and full of that math. And then little by little, I said, you know, this is a function and you'll find it again in another book. So I began like that. What has changed? Well, I would say, I want to disappoint you, but uh, Alan Turing summed up machine intelligence in an article in 1950. I haven't seen anything better since except hype. Now, what do we have since? We have Alan Turing's 1950 article. Believe me, I've seen it all. I've seen all of it. Massachusetts Institute of Technology, all of these. I've been, okay, so, but if you take that, what's different is that you have extreme computer power, extreme computer power. You have supercomputers where you can have 10,000 GPUs and tens of thousands of CPUs. Okay, that's incredible power. And at the same time, you have the web, the internet, which can provide an amount of data unprecedented in human history. So if you put supercomputers to power here, and then you put all that data, and in the middle of it, you put like uh, Turing machines or stochastic Turing machines algorithms of which, you know, can create all the variations you want. You have to know that all these equations are very old, like you have uh, Euler is used 
logistic regression is 18th century. You, you take all these equations, you'll go back like, I would say the most recent one is maybe, maybe first half of the 20th century. So what's powerful is you take that math, and the other, then you take internet, take the data, put all that in the big machine. I mean, it's fantastic. You get, you get super results. We have created an entity that has surpassed us. But of course, well, not many people have know that. That's why it's so good. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> That's why social media is so good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, definitely, definitely. You're I'll connecting go. to a smartphone that's one million times smarter than you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. And I'm, I'm excited to, to jump into where you think the field is going to be headed in the next couple of years. But before we do that, I'm really interested about these functions that you're writing in books. As, as you mentioned that as you're uh, reading books, you're coming up with like these functions to kind of describe what's going on. And you notice that there is similar functions across different bodies of work. Talk to me a little bit about this. Well, it goes back, uh, maybe I could start with one of my basic projects uh, in, in the 80s where I didn't have much help. There weren't many books. There was no internet. And people uh, would say, you know, I have this difficult problem. Go ask Rothman to do it. You know, he, he'll figure out. And, and he's cheap. He won't take a lot of money because he, he, likes, he likes what he does and he doesn't really care about money. So I started with aerospatial, which is now Airbus in the defense uh, industry. And they said, okay, you're teaching at the Sorbonne, but we've spent five years trying to figure out this algorithm on these uh, 286 processors. These are these very old processors, smartphone. And we need to put this on battleships and on airplanes and we just can't make it fast enough because it has to run in 12 seconds or, you know, you, the algorithm won't be in use anymore because they won't be there anymore. So and they said, what do you think? Well, I said, it looks easy to me. Uh, so how can it look easy to you? We've spent years trying. And I said, I don't know. I don't think like other people. So it's easy for me. So they say, how do you do that? Well, I said, I don't know. Just sign a contract. I say, okay, you sign up. But when you sign a contract with these corporations, you have to realize that you have penalties. So they say, if you get the penalties, you don't deliver, then you're going to have to sell your house. So I said, I'm not going to sell my house. I'm going to take the money. So, and you're only paid when it's run, it runs. So how does my brain, how do I function? I sit down and I think, uh, I go back 20,000 years and I say, our brain hasn't changed in 20,000. We think we just, we're just chimpanzees with laptops uh, at best. And at worst, we're chimpanzees with, chimpanzees with machine guns. Okay. So you can choose. Are, we, are you going to be, or you can take a knife, you can cut your meat or you can cut someone else out with it. So we haven't evolved that much. Okay. So I'd say 20,000 years ago, these people found incredible solutions to survive. I mean, uh, hunting, uh, group hunting and networks. You go there, go there, surround the animal, go back. So I, I would say, listen, the Roman Empire, for example, uh, had boats and ships anywhere. They, they didn't have computers. They had some way of doing this. Or I look at animals. You look at anthills, you look at cats, dogs. They have all kind. We're all animals. And then when I go into books, you can see the reasoning of someone. Like you can say, uh, I don't know. I, I'm a fan of uh, Kant, the, the German philosopher. So the ger German philosopher. For, let's. I'll give you a, a very precise example using him. So he spent hundreds and thousands. Of, he spent maybe thousands of pages writing, and then his critic of uh, pure reason. So you can say, what is he driving? What 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 is his tools? I need his tools for what I'm doing. So he's saying, well, first of all, the two main things you have to look at is space and time. Ah, okay, that's interesting. Now, who can find an exception to space and time? Nobody. If you want to do something in life, you're going to need space and time. Even if you're on a cloud server, well, it's in space. It's, it's, it's in a server in, in underground somewhere with heating, cooling systems and all that. So I said, okay, what are the basic things? So a long, long time ago, I created a triangle because I was always been fascinated by geometry that created a triangle and i said on the top of the triangle i'll put a task that's the task we have to do like today we have to talk okay what is the physical constraint the physical so i have the task now i have the physical constraint which you have to be sitting somewhere and i have to be sitting somewhere and we need this internet connection okay that's that's the bottom part of triangle and then you have on the other side of the triangle you have the constraints there's a time constraint 70 five minutes, 90 minutes. Uh, we have to have good internet. We have to be in good health. We don't have to be people attacking us with a, a gun trying to shoot us or a police trying to arrest us. So we have a whole pile of constraints. 
needs? Do we have ideas? Am I too shy to speak? Are you too shy to ask questions? Am I natural? Am I trying to give fake impressions? What am I trying to do? I can tell you immediately, I don't know how to put varnish on. People are getting the same conversation I had at a dinner table. So then you get this triangle, you get this triangle, and then in math, you can, ca you can calculate the center of gravity. If someone's always focused on tasks, well, it'll be up on top. He's never looking at the constraint. Maybe it's a billionaire. He never needs to think about anything, goes in the plane, doesn't know. Or maybe you're at the bottom, you're struggling, you're in Jamaica, or you're in Ghana, you don't have a good internet connection. So you're not very worried about this interview, you're worried about connecting to the interview. Okay, and then maybe if you live in India right now, the guy's saying, these guys have a nice conversation. What am I going to eat? Because, you know, I just lost a job and no one's asking me for a rickshaw anymore. So I've been, I haven't eaten in uh, three days. And these guys are talking about the future of what I don't even understand a word of what they're talking about. So his center of gravity will be here. And then you have people in constraints. They're saying, well, yeah, but I'm sick. So, so if you put all that together in this triangle, you can, and you think about it, think about it, you can fit every single single human activity in it. Anything, anything you want will fit in that triangle and it will create a center of gravity. Then you just write the functions and then you convert them into math and then you put them in a program and then you have one of the first expert systems I wrote. Of course, there's 12,000 lines of math. <laughs> <laughs> to describe my little triangle, it, it took thousands of hours, but I, I started from there. That is super, super fascinating. And I, I feel like I've had a similar experience with me. I mean, I, I read a ton just because I have so many wonderful authors that I've had the privilege of interviewing for this show. And I just feel like I find little bits of truth that I see resonated in many different books. And it, it sounds like you've been able to distill this down into a framework for yourself to help you understand the world and also help intelligent systems understand the world. So let's talk, talk about intelligent systems, AI, machine learning, all that stuff. What do you think will be the scariest application of AI machine learning in the next two to five years? Why are you speaking in the future? <laughs> <It's scary. laughs> how about what's the scariest application of it now? And then how do you see that getting even scarier in the future? Yeah, I, yeah, I think we're, um, we're already in a game over situation but I'm not worried about it. So it's just natural evolution. So let me just give you the context. Since you're ready to take some time, I'll make it as short as possible. Let's say, I'm not going to go too far back. Let's say 50,000 years ago to 100,000 years ago, we began to discover what a tool was. From that exact moment, we became something very different from our brothers and sisters, the chimpanzees and the gorillas, who are rather nice folks. You know, these are nice people. You don't see a chimpanzee uh, trying to strangle or rape and kill and burn a, a lady and bury it. So we became something else. We became with that tool. And then as the tools went on, we we began to create something else. Okay, I'll take it, I'll take it slowly so I don't lose you. The, we, the more tools. So now we can fast forward to maybe 12,000 years ago. Okay, 12,000 years ago, there was global warming started because we got out of the ice age and we expanded immediately into villages, right? Where I said, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to go hunting anymore. I'm going to take these little pigs here and put them there and then breed them and I'm going to eat them. Wow, that's cool. I'm not a I'm not a vegetarian chimpanzee anymore. I'm a I'm a meat eater. Ha ha. Okay, then we said um, so. I'm not going to go hunting. But why would I have to go looking for cherry? Let's. I'm going to use the wheat that I found here uh, somewhere, and I'm going to plant these grains so I don't have to move around anymore. So what happened at that point? Because there's a flaw in the theory of evolution. It's saying we evolved to survive. Okay, that's true. But to survive to what? Because chimpanzees and monkeys are got all the way to here. In fact, if if we didn't kill them and eat them, there would be as many monkeys as us. So that's not survival of humanity. It's survival of humanity in a certain environment. So when you reached the village part, we began to adapt to our own world, not to nature anymore. Of course, we continued to adapt to nature, but now we, I had to adapt to you because maybe you wanted my house. So I'm going to have to kill you. If you want my house, I'm going to have to kill you. And you know, in the old days, I might even have to eat you because I was hungry. So at that point, we began to don't worry, we're far away. You're in Canada. <laughs> so at that point, we began to adapt to what our own world and we, we built this intelligence. And since we're pretty intelligent, well, we created fascinating weapons and tools and we kept adapting. We, we were adapting to nature. You're not going to tell me that we built tanks to adapt to nature and bombs and because where we have the most imagination is weapons. 
You know, we're very, we're fantastic in creating weapons. You'll never see that on LinkedIn. That's what surprises me. That's one thing that surprises me is you never see how far the weapon race has gone and all the artificial intelligence is in there. But that's another story. So we began to become, we developed our own intelligence to adapt to ourselves. And since we keep, we've been racing for 12,000 years, we reached a point where we can't, we couldn't adapt alone. Because when the internet happened, if you wanted the search engine, you want to search something, I'm looking for, I don't know, I'm looking for the definition of, of a crystal. I don't want to see 1 million pages of uh, something else. I want to have the real, I want to get directly to the subject. So in the beginning, artificial intelligence was just an, uh, an algorithm to help us just to survive in our, the new environment we created, which is internet, which is not much different from the villages we created in the 12,000 years ago, because they're virtual too. Those villages were virtual. They're not real life anymore. It's, it's stuff we invented. So villages are the first virtual thing. And there's nothing new today because 100 years ago, we invented the phone that separated us and all that stuff. So we're just going into this virtual curve. We, it's not really virtual. We're creating another world. Now, why are you going to be scared today? Because, well, I'm not scared, but people that don't understand artificial intelligence should be. So what happened now is we have these fantastic algorithms. They're, I mean, mind-blowing algorithm. And what has happened is e-business has taken over physical business, okay? And social media has taken over everything. Everyone is looking at this object. This object is the center of everyone's life. I was looking just before we connected at the Senate hearings in the U.S. Senate for the Supreme Justice nominee, and there was this incredible speech where this person starts. I'm not going to talk about party lines because people, you know, go crazy with politics. So there was one guy who was very interesting. He says, I want to say something different because I've noticed that all the other people that speak after one minute, everybody's looking at the smartphone anymore again, right? If you go to a conference today and you see someone speak, a speaker is coming up. He's the unique. He's the super intelligent. He comes from the planet Jupiter. And he's going to tell you how to be a billionaire. And he has more intelligence than 10 aliens together. And he starts to speak after one minute. Everyone <laughs> so I even remember a conference I did in Varna, Bulgaria, like two years ago. And I said, and, and I said, you know, I'm not going to make a conference because no one's going to listen. So I'm just going to speak what I want to say. And when I see one of you bored, I'm going to ask you a question. So after one minute, everyone was there. But after two minutes, I say, Okay, you there with the smartphone. What do you think about that? And it turned into this, to this huge conversation with several hundred people. Every time I saw him with the smartphone, I talked to him. And at the end, it was pretty interesting. So what's happened is the AI in here, I would say modestly, is a billion times more intelligent than us right now. If you go on YouTube and you're going to see how far this goes. No, you go, you're on LinkedIn, right? Okay, let's take LinkedIn, but it could be anyone. You go on LinkedIn. What do you think you're looking at? You're looking at yourself. You'll never learn something else except what you are because they're going to type I'm going to watch what Dennis Rothman is doing. What happens? The next day, you see, you see me in your feed. Then the day after, you see someone that's close to my feed. Then the day after, you see someone else. That, so you're only seeing what you want to see. So you're not doing what I did as a child. You don't have to adapt anymore. The, the system is adapting to you. So now you're losing. You're, you don't have to adapt. You're not adapting. You're just looking at yourself all the time. Okay. So the next day, then, then you're going to see a job offer. Oh, well, you know, we found something that could fit. And this thing is so powerful. If you take it to YouTube, for example, is that it will show you videos and so smart, much smarter than us because it has, it knows more about us than we do. It will tweak it a bit. It'll take you a little step further. But I like to play with the algorithms. So I play with different clicks to see what's going to happen. And at one point, you get a, an ad. Oh, you're unhappy with your life. You're a data scientist. You studied to do artificial intelligence and you're not doing what you want. And look at me. I am now self-employed and I have five employees. So it's smarter than us. And it's driving consumption, clickbaits. It's 10 times smarter than us, which means that after you're what, like 25, 30? I wish. I'm 37. You're 37, okay? Yeah. You're in a generation where you knew something before internet. 
I would say before Google. You're a pre-Google person. But someone that's 15, so let's say you're a pre-Google person. So I would say you come 20 years after the first village, 12,000 years ago. That means that you were born as a hunter and then you moved to a village. So you remember what a hunter was. So when someone says, oh, those pigs, and I'll say, that's boring. I mean, what kind of life is that? I'm just going to sit here and watch pigs all my life? I want to go out. I want to go chase a lion. I want to get the adrenaline. I want, I don't want that. I want to go see what's happening. So you, you have both. Someone that's at 15 is in the village. He doesn't know what it is to be a hunter anymore. He's forgotten that. It's, it's lost. He knows social media. So now he's in this world and he's looking at his culture. And as you see the origin of hate on social media, it's just a miniature of the wars we did before because we would live in our little village and the guy over there doesn't have the same face color. Hmm, I'm going to kill him. These people don't have the same God. Well, I'm going to kill them too. Uh, these people don't dress like me. I'm going to kill them. So we fueled real wars with uh, these differences. So now we're creating these little villages on the social media we call groups. And we live in our group and we see in our group. So, and, and you'll notice, I like, I like to do this. I like to say, like I'm looking at, I vote on both sides of the Atlantic. So I look at Democrats and look at Republicans. So I go and I look at these Republican YouTube videos that are extremely well done. I mean, logic, Democrats, they're devils. And then you have all these comments that agree with them. I mean, I'm talking about 1 million views, 200,000 views. We're not talking about 10 views. And then as I click on them, because I, I, I like to play around a lot with these algorithms, because since I know how they work, I get more and more of these Republicans and they get smarter and smarter and smarter. They're not these little stupid, you know, people. They're very smart. Hmm. And I say, let's go now. Let me change my clicks to Democrats that are saying that Republicans are devils. And little by little, it builds up to more and more intelligent speech because sometimes it, it sees that I'm clicking on complex videos. So I get more and more. So you can see that it can become, if you're not doing what I'm doing, if you don't look at the opposite of what you think, like I had to learn when I was seven or eight, you're going to build in you're going to be controlled completely, and it'll take you to where you're not. It could take you to a protest, a physical protest, where you see, yeah, you see how bad they are. Come to the city. We're going to break them down. And the other side says, oh, let's go to the city. Let's try to stop them from breaking it down. And then when they meet, they've been totally conditioned, like uh, Paleolithic warriors, to fight each other, and then you see people die. <laughs> so you're speaking in the present, my, my friend. Yeah, yeah, it's really, really interesting. It, something, me, pretty much everything you said reminded me of this, this Joseph Campbell quote. Now I'm just thinking off the top of my head. So Joseph Campbell, uh, huge into to mythology, hero's journey and all that. And he talks about how all cultures are, are founded on myth. And then he talks about the individual and how the individual must be shaped. He must be made to react in the way that the culture wants them to. And here we are now in an age where we can create our own culture. Like I, I'm Punjabi, I'm Indian, I could be born into this culture, but because of... So the what is that, internet, Rajasthan? Uh, no, Punjab. Punjab, so yeah. northwest? Uh, yeah, that's right, yeah. Just below Moenjo Daro and Harappa. Yeah, you Harappa, yeah, I yeah, know Harappa, yeah. Harappa was in, in, it's yeah. now in modern Punjab, but yeah, that's probably the civilization closest to... Uh, 2,500 years before Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah. They had writing and they had... Uh, sanitation water. system yeah yeah it's most sophisticated sanitation it was the culture i think that was uh based or really took purification rituals i think to the extreme and that's yes but it's where well they come in fact they came from somewhere else which is the basis of the whole indo-european mm -hmm. culture yeah yeah it's interesting okay I mean. so yeah you can build your own culture on social media yeah, and then the algorithms are just, they're shaping you to react in the way that this culture wants you to react, right? So if you are down the rabbit hole of conservative Republican stuff, and that's all you are becoming uh, exposed to because- but Or radical the, Democrat. Let's or radical be, Democrat, that's the same fair. thing too. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's very true. I would just say, if you're talking in my language, it's radical X. Radical X, yeah. It's a, X is a variable. You can be a radical Republican, a, ra a radical Democrat, a, ra a radical Muslim, a radical Jew, a radical Catholic. Just put radical plus the variable, and now you know how I think. Yes, we got to find it within ourselves to square ourselves, though, right? Because if you take the radical, there's no, nah, never mind. I'm, tr I'm trying to make you square roots and exponent joke here, but it's, it's not landing. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, because the word uh, radical yeah. brings me back to hate, mm -hmm. and hate brings me back to survival reactions of people that go back 20,000 years, which means that we've introduced survival reactions into social media mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that become physical in real life. That's the problem is as long as you're on social media insulting people, that's okay. But once that survival reaction is in real life, then that's, 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 I'm not going to say it's scary because that's, that's, it's been like this for thousands of years. Yeah. To put it in the, the words of cybersecurity attacks, they call that like a kinetic outcome where it goes from cyberspace into the real world. That's that kinetic outcome. But we had that 20,000 years ago. You knew you would have a priest saying yeah. they are the devils. We need to kill them. And the soldier will say, bless us, bless us. It's the basis. You know this. And then you have some people that think maybe like we are. And you have Arujana, Arujana in mm -hmm. the Bhagavad Gita. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's how it starts. Yeah. In the middle of a battle, they're going to fight, right? That's how the Bhagavad Gita starts. And he's thinking, is this right? Where, where does this fit in the universe? What am I doing here? You know, how many, th that, that's maybe, that's before Christ. That's maybe 2,000 years before. It was probably several thousand years before it came in a written form. So we have soldiers, intelligent soldiers, thousands of years ago saying, why am I doing this? And they tried to connect it to some superior force. What's up, artists? I would love to hear from you. Feel free to send me an email to theartistsofdatascience at gmail.com. Let me know what you love about the show. Let me know what you don't love about the show. And let me know what you would like to see in the future. I absolutely would love to hear from you. I've also got open office hours that I will be hosting. And you can register by going to bit.ly dot com forward slash a d s o h i look forward to hearing from you all and i look forward to seeing you in the office hours let's get back to the episode so how does explainable ai fit into this new world that we have i guess let's since we're on the topic of it let's get into the ethics of, of artificial intelligence what do we need to know as practitioners of data science and machine learning? How do we ensure that we are building systems that are ethical? Okay, let's say it the nice way and let's say it the realistic way. Okay, let's say it the nice, uh, polished, uh, living room way, uh, conference type. Uh, yes, we need to control the data. We need more regulations. We need, okay, so I'll skip that, okay? Because you have maybe 15 conferences where people are going to tell you that. Okay, so everyone's going to say, yeah, yeah, the beautiful world. Well, go stop Google, Facebook. I just read an interesting interview of Zuckerberg. He's Jewish. Okay. He says, I'm Jewish, but I don't forbid people from saying that the Holocaust did not exist on Facebook, that the extermination camps did not exist. And the reporter said, when I asked him, I was wondering why he would answer that. So I would say, let's take ethics and leave it in a little corner for the moment because it's so easy to say and so cliche that we're not going to make it in a converse, in a real conversation with that. What we have to understand is to go back to what I I said, if you're on social media, if you're on Facebook, well, we're on, and real life now is Facebook. People look at the news on Facebook in the United States. Over 50% look at their news on Facebook. They follow people on Twitter. They follow on Instagram. They on WhatsApp. The, the, whole, the social media is the real life. And if you look at kids 15, they're on their bicycle and they're looking at this while they're on their bicycle. Real life is here. And if you say, you know, real life, maybe we should talk. Talk about what? Okay, so let's say now you have a supercomputer talking to you that knows everything about you, everything you clicked, everything you followed, and it has a billion and a half parameters. Now, if you can find someone in all your interviews that's going to say, you know what, I'm going to tell you why that uh, algorithm decided that uh, he predicted before he knew it that he would click on that video. Before I know it, they display something that they have the probability that I will click on. Now, who is going to go into the algorithm, let's say uh, a Boltzmann, uh, restricted Boltzmann uh, machine with uh, millions of, and you have these people, I, I just love it when they say, I can explain, oh, sure, go, just tell me which one of the million parameters and weights that made that decision there. Of course, they can't answer. No one can answer. And you know what? The people at Google, Amazon, Facebook can't answer either because it's too complex for anybody. It just does the right thing as long as it's bringing in ads 
and the people are clicking, then it's good. If it does, if the person is going away, then that's bad. So you have to nudge him again, maybe with you know on his phone or something. So at this point, it's useless to say we're going to control it through data and algorithms. You can limit it. I wrote it in my book with regulations. Yeah, I took uh, racial stuff out of there. Okay, that's the basics. You can take the basics. But what people don't realize is no, we don't care about private data anymore. What is gender? You're going to say, oh, I'm afraid of my private data. So what? what is gender? Are you a man or not? Or a woman? When I received my form to vote, it was written male, female, other. So I said other. Hmm, what can I be? So I can be whatever I want. Then I received another official U.S. form saying male, female, transgender, transgender female, transgender male, other. So I said, wow, that's, that's becoming complicated. So actually, that's not a real parameter anymore because you can have women that act like men, men that like, that's, that's not interesting. Age, who knows? You have 12-year-old kids watching porno all day on internet. So is he an adult? He's always clicking him over 18, okay? But he's looking at these videos, he's 12. Or he's playing, playing Grand Theft Auto at 10 years old, okay? Or Assassin's Creed is over 18, he's playing at 14. So I would say the lines of private data are blurred. So everyone's saying, we need to protect private data. We don't care about private data and artificial intelligence anymore. We're looking at content. So if you're looking at a, a, a film on Netflix and, or a video on YouTube, we just take 100,000 100, features. We put you in there and we say, ah, he's watching that type of video. So he has that kind of behavior. So I don't need to know. Uh, I don't need to even to, you don't need to tell me where you live. I have your hub. I know that you're from France. I know that you're from this region in France. You don't have to. I'm hiding my location with a VPN. Oh, yeah, sure. You mean? that I can't find out your culture by what you're writing in your content? <laughs> the guy's writing, I live in a place where there's a religious leader and that uh, the U.S. has imposed uh, an embargo on us and uh, women wear veils. We can't always say what we want and there's a, a, a religious police. Now, if the guy can't figure that's Iran, he's going to have a problem. Well, I live in a state, but I'm not going to tell you where, where there's same-sex marriage. And all. So you can, with content, you can derive anything. And in fact, you can find out that a man is thinking like a woman or a woman is thinking like a man. So you take the content and then you just build a portrait of that person, you, you create his world, you put him in his bubble, it's a true man show. You know that movie? Social media is a gigantic true man show with billions of true man shows and you're all, you're inside and you don't know that there's another world. So forget about trying to go into the algorithms and the data because you can filter it all you want. We'll always make deductions with IoT, uh, Internet of Things, ITT, if then this, that. We'll always find a way to know where you come from and all that. So where does explainable AI come in? For The way I see it as an interesting tool is, okay, first thing is AI cannot explain AI. Fine. XI is model agnostic, just like I was when I was a child. It's an Italian model, French model. I don't care. I'm going to build a common model. So XAI is model agnostic. It's a different set of equations that's going to look at the input and it's going to look at the output. It's going to run the algorithm or it's going to observe all the outputs and it's to say, you know why you said that? That feature. It's because you said that word. You said that word and that led to that answer. You're looking at that video because you chose video 1, 6, and 17 and it found a common concept and that's why you're clicking. That's the future of XAI. That's a fantastic field. Now, how do I see it? I see it so you get all these explanations. My book is full of these explanations. And we're just at the beginning of it. I think XAI is going to become as powerful as AI. Now, <laughs> there's a good news and bad news. <laughs> XAI is going to be, the way I do it already, I can explain almost any algorithm, okay, the output, and I can find the features. And since I like to calculate, I can do it even now when I click on Netflix or anywhere, I know what it's doing because I know the equation. So, I, you know, it's like someone who can count without a calculator. So XAI is going to be exponential. People that think, oh, it's this ethical thing, it's, you better watch out. It's going to be an incredible tool, fantastic. It's going to explain anything without even looking at the model. So at that point, the good, let's, I'll start with the good news. The good news is what I see, and I'm not going to develop it too lazy now. I've developed uh, tens of thousands of hours, but I see it as an add-on to a browser, non-intrusive. 
like you go on YouTube and it's record, it's going through your history and you have this algorithm that then they say auto portrait, you know, to make it a bit engaging. You want your auto portrait here, click there. It's going to tell you who you are, psycho, you know, like who you are uh, and bing, it's going to say, wow, this is, these are the features that the machine learning algorithm used and is, and this is your true men show. That's where you in. And then at the bottom of it, I see a recommendation. I say, you know what? I can see that you have, you're in a group and you never change ideas. Ideas. You're stuck. You're stuck in a hole. I would suggest, even if you don't agree, click on these links and these videos that show contrary views to what you're thinking, or other music that you've never listened to, or classical music because you're always listening to this music, or modern music because you're only used listening to classical music, or listen to Democrats because you're only watching Republicans, look at Biden because you're only looking at Trump. I would say it would be a bit educational, and then when you click, you get like, ah, your social media IQ has gone up one point because for the moment you're really dumb. <laughs> so you start at IQ 50 and you say, up, oh, you're up to 60, you're almost 100. And then, then little by little, it could be like a game, you know, for people and it can be engaging. And then the little by little, I see, I see Google face, I see these platforms, they're not our enemies. They don't even realize if you go, if I talk to Zuckerberg right now and I told him, you know, what he said, he said, wow, you know, every day I'm just trying to make billions of dollars. I, that's a good idea. Why don't I put it in? You know why I'm going to put it in? I'm going to put it in. That's the bad news. I'm going to put it in two ways. I'm going to put it in the navigator. People are going to come running to my platform. Click, 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 click. And I'll put ads. I'll put advertisements next to the stuff for psychological analysis. And I'm going to make billions out of your stuff. That's a super idea. Okay, that's the good news. Now, the, the, where's the bad news? The good news, business is good news. Bad news is Zuckerberg is going to say, ah, and Twitter, hey, that's smart. Why don't I feed this XI, XAI bad, back into AI like a turbo? I'm going to make my AI into a superpower. <laughs> so now you can, re you can insert the XAI into the Truman Show. And from time to time with your dial, you put something opposite. So you can say, my platform is objective. When a person comes, we always show them a different idea, but the idea can just be slightly his, but just a little different, and it'll stay in the Truman Show. So as long as you click, you're okay. Reminds me of a documentary I just recently watched on Netflix. Interestingly enough, I forgot what it was called, like The Social Dilemma. Or was it that yeah, one? Yeah, Social Dilemma. Yeah, it's, an yeah. Excellent, it's an excellent video. I watched it for several days. I took notes at every image. I went to every site. In fact, I'm in the human uh, center thing. I'll be in there and I'll be in a debate tomorrow with them. I looked at the books and I reached a conclusion. I reached several conclusions. One, the idea is, is, is good. I mean, it's a good idea for people to explain that. The thing is, they're giving viewers the illusion that something's going to change by watching that video. I didn't hear them talk. Of, they say, stop, go away from media, uh, close your Facebook account, close. Sure. So I'm going to say a, a bad word. Uh, go for it. Because I really like these people. It's not going to be a bad word in terms of language, but I'm going to say oh. it's naive. Okay. Mm. It's like saying that someone is eating hamburgers and soda every day and you say, okay, let's just close McDonald's and no one's going to, everyone's going to eat well. <laughs> so, so the solution to your diet is to shut down supermarkets and shut down fast food. That way you're going to eat less. And you know what? We're going to close all the shops. That way you can go hunting again. So I, I, I would say it's naive. Okay. That's my nice word for it. it it's naive. Okay. Uh, and that's where it disappointed me. And, uh, and, and if someone, uh, if I'm in the debate tomorrow, I'll tell them, I'll be telling them that it's very naive uh, to think that uh, you're going to say, Oh, you're, you're driving your car. You're, it's, it's, it's naive. I mean, uh, you know, how naive can that be? What I think is that it's excellent in its description, but it offers no realistic solution. Because then I went to the sites they were talking about, and there was one called All Site. All Site. And it says, on this site, it's very objective. When you read this site, you will get the news from Social Dilemma is solved. So you see news and it's written, you have a little thing indicator left, center, right. So you know Fox News, right? Then you have center, I don't know, uh, I don't know, a New Yorker or something like that. And then you have left Washington Post, ping, ping, ping. Okay. So I looked at it and I looked at several articles and then I said, then I looked at the glossary and then I... It, does, it never says if it's the truth or not. It does, what do I care if the guy, the earth is flat. 
the right wing said the earth is flat. The left wing said the earth is flat. The center says the earth is flat. My conclusion is that the earth is flat, <laughs> right? So it, all sides is not solving my problem because you're taking free will away from people. So I think that the real solution is this extension, this XAI extension that becomes like, you know, ad blockers or stuff like that. I'm not trying, and I'm not going to block anyone. I'm going to say non-intrusive. You have this extension. If I'm a parent, I would make it compulsory. If you're on the, the web, I'm going to activate this parent control, which is automatic control. And it's going to, every time you go on the web, I'm sorry, my little child, you're going to see a little, it's going to be small on the top right of your screen. Uh, you spent this much much time on this video. Your IQ is at 50. You're going down and down into the Truman Show. Click here to look at something else. I would, I'd use a super intelligence to educate the person that's on the web. And that's the solution. The solution is not to forbid things. You, like imagine when China was using gunpowder for fireworks, right? Mm -hmm. And people were saying, you know, China, there was so peaceful. They had gun power, but they were just using it for firework. Now, how, I'm not going to say the bad word again, how naive could that be? It's just because they didn't have the metal, the cannon that could contain the gun power. And every time you put it, it would explode. So once they found it, of course, they have cannons. So we've had cannons for what, like uh, centuries? Have you seen anyone ban cannons? I mean, no. how ridiculous can it be? So, or rifles or guns or anything? No, or food? No, you can't ban it. You have to introduce XAI, I would say, in extension. And uh, I'm pretty sure that, you know, one day when people realize what I just said, because I've been here for decades watching all this, it's sometimes I'm 10 years ahead, sometimes I'm 20 years ahead, because I've had, I'm talking 40 years here, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so, so I'm pretty sure that in the end, there always going to be someone said, click, you have this Chrome extension, just click it in your browser, you get your IQ in real time, time spent, and then click and get advice. And this should help people. That's it. You can't do more. Really, really fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing that. I'm curious, how do you view data science, machine learning, AI? Do you think it's an art or purely a hard science? That's your, one of your questions in your questionnaire. And I was saying, gee, how am I going to answer that question? <laughs> because it's a philosophical question. And let's take architecture. When a person is building something today, is it art or is it just functional? You know, it's, it's now, if you look at a cathedral or a mosque, you know, a beautiful mosque in the Middle East or something like that, you say, wow. That's art. If you look at a, a building, maybe you say that's not art. So first, we're going to have to define what art is. You know, what is art? Uh, now, I have some ideas when I think about it is, uh, I'm going to tell you something maybe strange for you, but it's obvious in artificial intelligence. Now, you can use the same algorithm for painting. You can use the same algorithm. So I have coded algorithms I'm a music player. I got my piano when, uh, when I was four years old. So I'm a music. I play music almost every day around uh, eleven or midnight when everything's calm. Okay, so I put equations in uh, music. So at that point, I would say it can be an art if there's inspiration or something. It's it's. It, I would say it's it, it's like a rainbow. It, it's you take a. It, it depends. First, it can be a tool for someone that has no imagination. Uh, he's just doing structural artificial intelligence. He's taking k-means clustering. He learned math. He has zero imagination. He goes to a corporation. He implements it and works super fine. The CEO is happy because you know what? He doesn't want creative people around. He said, "No, come on. I don't want to spend money on nothing. I, I I like this guy. He's down to earth. I I told I gave him and it's done. Okay, so that's fine." This person is more useful than the, the creative people because if you don't have a plumber, you don't have a house. You need an architect, you know, to think of the, about all that. But if you don't have the bricklayer, you're not going to get a house either. So, so that's fine. Now, we can fast forward through the spectrum. And at the other end, you have the pure, 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 pure creative artificial intelligent person that creates these things that no one understands and no one even knows what they're going to do with it or how it's going to be applied, okay? And if you want to pay your mortgage, you better be somewhere in between. <laughs> If you want to be the super creative artist and never sell something in your life, go ahead. But if you want to pay your mortgage, you better back down a bit in the spectrum. So it, the, the idea is to use enough creativity and art to feed into your practical, non-imaginative self and generate bills that generate money that pay your mortgages.
the best way is to be somewhere, you know, floating around in the spectrum and not on the extremes. That's a good answer. Yeah, yeah definitely. Thank you so much. I mean, this conversation is taking a completely different turn than what I anticipated. And it's been much more interesting and entertaining than what I had planned. So uh, yeah, last- I was just hoping you wouldn't fall asleep. No, absolutely not. This was super fascinating. <laughs> like I said- it? Well, Dennis, I would like to ask you a question. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, those other data science questions kind of put me to sleep. I like to hear about people and people's experiences. Like it is just always, always, like I said, it's so fascinating to me. Like here it is. This is another person miles and miles away across the ocean. You're in Paris. I'm in Canada. Canada. You've had an entirely you different Toronto? Life. Uh, Winnipeg. Winnipeg. Wow, you're really you're really near. That's very far away. That's that's yeah. far. And it's just always interesting to me to hear people's experiences and their perspectives on things. Wow. So and, it's what like nine o'clock? Uh, it's eleven a.m. right now. Eleven a.m. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So last formal question here before we jump into a quick random round. It is one hundred years in the future. What do you want to be remembered for? Ah, now let me give you the bad news. We will both be forgotten. <laughs> Bill Gates will be forgotten. Elon Musk will be forgotten. About every guy that thinks he's important right now will be forgotten. I learned that when I was reading from Mark Oral. He's a Roman emperor and general. And he said, people that will be remembered is more like Socrates, Plato. You'll get Caesar. You know, you, you really have to do something enormous to be remembered. The only thing I see today is try in my everyday life to bring the best to my children to the best to my grandchildren, to the best to people I talk to you like you or write to. Maybe somehow it'll work into their genes. And maybe a hundred years from now, you'll have one of my great, 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 great grandchildren, if my lineage goes that far, that will be able to both think and smile. I think it's in the genes that I'll go through. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I think the Roman Emperor you're speaking of, uh, Marcus Aurelius. Could that be the one? Yeah. Yeah, Marcus uh, Aurelius. Yeah, he's also. One of my favorite. He's definitely. I yes. have about 50 books that I've been reading uh, all my life, and I keep going back to them. Meditations is quite good, and you know, Stoicism is my operating system for life. That's yes. The, the philosophy I most adhere to. And in the meditations, he has this, this blurb, uh, the speed with which all things vanish, the objects in the world. And the that's right. You just, in time. just have your present moment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I, I spent a lot of time on his uh, present moment. Mm. And unfortunately, 2000 years later, uh, there's a slight error in his thinking because the present doesn't exist in the sense that by the time my voice gets to you and the signal goes through your brain and you're processing it, you're looking at the past of what you perceive. You can't, you're never in real time. We're never in real time. There's a, there's a processing time. So we're, we're always lagging. Our, our brain is always lagging on what's going on. So we have the past and that's all we have, in fact, because when we do the future, we're just doing combinations of the past to think of what the future could be based on the tracks we see. So if we see a track going that way, oh, the future is going to go that way. Oh, yeah, the future. I think a more interesting question is what are we going to look like in a thousand years? And people should worry that if the planet is still can, you know, is, is habitable, you can still live on the planet, we might have evolved in another species because okay. we're going to be genetically modified and not too long. So we might be something else. So we'll keep talking about the future, but the future doesn't include us necessarily. <laughs> Interesting. The latency of the present moment. I think that is a, a, a podcast episode unto itself. That is a very interesting concept. Thank you so much for shedding light on that and uh, meant so much more to get into, but let's, let's go ahead and jump into the random round. What are you currently most excited about or currently exploring? Well, there was a question you, you, you had put forth uh, in your questionnaire was, when you were 15, what did you want to be, right? And when I was 15, between the age 15 and about 2021, I set my life goals. I set them in the spiritual field, sphere, everything I am today. And I've been careful to check every year that I can talk to my 15-year-old self, that I haven't uh, become something different from the dreams of a teenager. So I would say that every day, every morning, every evening, I spend a lot of time readjusting, say, whoa, 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 where is this going? I'm spending too much time on this. I have to go back to that. So I'm on this path that I've been on for like 50 years, and I'm, so I'm going to stay there. So every day, my main thought is keep on that path. 
now the main the main idea of this path beyond you know meditation which is always personal no one can speak about meditation because it can't be expressed in words so it's no use wasting our time explaining things that are can't be explained <laughs> meditation is unexplainable worse than ai so the other thing i i like these models i just like to observe people uh, like uh i it's I'm, I'm i haven't changed since i'm seven i like like one thing we like to do with my wife is we like to walk around the neighborhood every day we walk around the neighborhood every day and i like to look at everyone I look at other people. How do they live? What time do they get up? Uh, did they go shopping? What? And then sometimes, yeah, why is that person always sitting in his chair watching TV? That, that intrigues me. I, it can worry me like for an hour in the evening. Why, why is he alone there? So maybe the next day when I go around and say, hey, hi, and I'll talk to the person and then I'll engage and little by little, I'll learn about him. He'll learn about me. Uh, I think what's fascinating is what you're like, we agree probably is other people. What can be more fat? And other things and looking at planets and looking at animals. I spend a lot of time observing animals. Like I've always had a cat and their next door neighbor has a dog, but it's now my dog because every time he sees, every time the dog sees me, you know, he wants to play, eat. And you can learn a lot. You can learn a lot about how their reasoning and how they reach a decision. I can't tell you how many equations I wrote that I delivered to customers based on what animals do. <laughs> you get five lines of powerful stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think Alan Watts said it that people who are interesting are people who are interested. Yes. I well, I have another way of putting it. You can't see the light. You can't understand something unless you explain it to someone else. And you can't see the light in yourself if you don't see the light in others. It's impossible. We're a group, we're a collective. It's collective intelligence. What do you believe that other people think is crazy? Yeah, I saw that one too. I knew I was going to get these tough questions. I mean, well, what always comes to me when I say that and I look at other people's faces and might even surprise you, in fact, is love with a capital L. That means that is uh, in vertically integrated. It mean, goes from the highest spiritual level to the lowest molecule is love, not in the sense of naive, because I guess you know by now that I, I'm not interested in naive thinking, but of merging. Love is merging. Love is becoming something bigger than yourself all the time. Because you know, we're nothing. So as soon as you love, then you, you grow, you grow, you grow. So I say love is the most fundamental concept that humanity has. I mean, there's nothing above that. Not artificial intelligence, certainly not artificial intelligence, stuff like that. I mean, that's, these are tools like a, a hammer or a screwdriver. I mean, you know, like when I was speaking about how smart an artificial intelligence is, sure, my car can go faster than I can. I'm not scared of cars, but love. So I'd say when, pe when I say that, people ask for an explanation. And, I, and it's not from me. Uh, my father taught me that. He said, I've been through everything from Russia to United States to Second World War to extermination camps to uh, Nazi trials. Forget it all. Forget about the money. Forget about love. If you have someone that loves you and you love that someone, I mean, poof, I mean, forget <laughs> The rest is a joke. No, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, natural affection towards all of humanity is something that people should... And everything, not only humanity, everything. A star, yeah. the moon, an animal. Uh, basically, it's, you know, you find this in Buddhism. Mm -hmm. uh, you find this in Hinduism. You find this in mystical Islam, uh, mystical Catholicism, uh, mystical philosophers, mystical astronomers who will look at the stars. They, even if they don't believe in God, they look at these stars and they say, oh, wow. Okay, so it's in everybody. That's our, that's our basic human quality, whether we're a hate, atheist or believer or whatever. And no yeah. one can live without it. Yeah, definitely contemplate your place in the cosmos, right? Like, and uh, I, I don't know my place. Yeah, well, you still recognize your interconnectedness in this entire system, okay. right? That I don't know where we come from. I don't know where we're going. I don't know what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just sitting here and I'm trying to figure out that, that that's another crazy thing is what I find crazy in other people, is, that really bothers me. How can I sit here and it's, I'm eating in a restaurant and people, and no one's saying, what, are we, what am I doing here? Well, where am I, where am I going? Why am I here? That has troubled me since I've been three or four. Mm. That's really troubling. There's no answer to that. It's really troubling. Some heavy, heavy troubles for a toddler, indeed. That's how I was born, unfortunately. <laughs> let's, uh, let's jump into a random question generator here. Now I'll pull it up right here. And starting with the first question, we've got, who are some of your heroes? 
Well, um, the first one that comes to my mind, because yeah, I see this little duck and it, you know, it looks like a bit like pop culture, is a pastor. When Michael Jackson uh, passed away, I watched uh, the ceremony because I'm, I'm a great Michael Jackson fan. I just love the way this guy created music. And, and I was listening to this pastor. He was, I'm small, but he was smaller than I. And he was, he was part of Black America and all that. And, and he, he said something. I mean, it's, stuck in my mind. He says, I don't care if you sweep streets. I don't care if you're a garbage man. I don't care what you do. Be a Mozart in what you're doing and you'll elevate yourself. I mean, that, oh, that's, he's a hero. <laughs> okay. That, yeah. And then, uh, of course, in my background, uh, people that give their lives for other people, like, you know, uh, of course, this comes from my cultural past people on D-Day that were dying by thousands on, you know, on the beaches uh, full of blood and still trying to fight for an idea. And then I'm going to say something completely surprising. Uh, Candace Owens. I don't know if you know Candace Owens. No, don't know. She's like 30, 31. She's a black conservative in the United States. Um, I'm not a conservative. I mean, you can guess that listening to me through this conversation. <laughs> conservative would have more structured, you know, thoughts. And uh, she's a black conservative. She makes incredible mistakes. She thinks that global warming doesn't exist. I mean, sometimes she says things that she just hears people repeat. But in the core of her, or if we take all these mistakes she's making away, just listen. That's why you have to listen to people that don't agree with you. She says, stop being victims. You're not a victim. Whoever you are, you're not a victim. Go out and do something. And in fact, Stevie Wonder came out to defend her a bit. And he said, stop moving around with your mouth and stop moving with your legs, which means because I could feel like a victim, you know, uh, from where I come from in my culture, because I've been rejected by all the cultures I mentioned, mm -hmm. because I'm not I'm not really any of them. So every time I would say, you know, I'm Italian, but you're not Italian. I'm Jewish, but you're not Jewish. You're Catholic, but you're not Catholic. You're American, but you don't live in the States. You're French, but you're American. So you're German. No, you're not German, just born in German. So I got rejected by all of this when I was a teenager. And instead of being a victim, you have to find a way in life. So Candace Owens, I like, I like this woman because uh, I don't agree with 90% of what she says. But in these 10%, there are a lot of heroes. Uh, I could, I, I could name a hundred heroes. I could, I Very can name my next door neighbor. Yeah. Uh, my next door neighbor is like middle class. He just bought his house, and I see him close his shutters around eight thirty in the evening because every morning he gets up at four and five to go work. And when he comes back, I can hear him talk to his children. He's always nice to them. He's nice to his dog. He's nice to his wife. On weekends, he makes these barbecues. In the summer, he has he, he pumps the swimming pool so they can play in the water. And I hear his wife doing the homework outside. Uh, there are a lot of everyday heroes. Uh, one, one, one I like also in 1980, I was in uh, Rajasthan and uh, I was one in, one in this hotel and I saw this guy in a rickshaw and uh, that puzzled me. So uh, that really puzzled me. I said, how can you go on that rickshaw? You're thin enough. I could blow you away. You, uh, you don't eat. I mean, obviously you don't have money. So what I did on that day is I had a lot of fun because I did the rickshaw for him. I got on the rickshaw and I drove him around. It was in Agra and I drove him and he was the king of the day, you know, but then I was very careful when I was in Varanasi, you know, ben the sacred city. Mm -hmm. That's 1980. And I have the picture in my house. It's, it was in my living room for like 30 years until it began to fade. These are heroes. The, these are the one of the first heroes I saw. It was at the beginning of the rain season, and there was no sewage system, as you know, in many uh, in the place. And and you could sm you could smell that was pretty bad. And here you had in, in 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 the middle of two puddles, two men sitting down drinking tea in the middle of a, a place where you know where cars would go around, and they had their two umbrellas, and they were laughing and they were chatting. I say, I, I mean, I told my wife, I told the 
car, stop the car. I want to take a picture. I would just, I didn't want to bother them. I didn't go. I took picture and I said, wow, these guys are above. I mean, they are top. I've seen thousands of heroes. Now, I haven't seen two heroes. I don't, I don't think Elon Musk is a hero. I don't think Bill Gates is a hero. I don't admire these people. I admire their business career, but I don't buy, I don't admire anything. They, they, I don't admire a guy that sends rockets into space, but has tens of thousands of homeless people around his office or his, his, the, the force is burned. I admire his genius. Elon Musk is a genius, a pure business genius. And the only really industrial genius we have right now, he, can, he, he got these cars to work, these rockets, Hyperloop. He is a pure traditional 16th century genius. But like most of those guys, the, the human side is not so good when you look at their personal life. <laughs> so he's not my hero. I would admire the homeless person in Los Angeles that found a job, got a house, got a wife, made children, and made them happy. Wow. Or, or, or even if the guy got another husband, I'm not, I'm not, you know, he can even marry another, per, another man and adopt a homeless ch child on the street. These are the people I admire. Another one, you know, I, I'll stop after this one because I can go on for hours on heroes I like. There's this one lady, in French lady, uh, called uh, Sister Emmanuel, a Catholic, and she was a sister all her life and a traditional sister. And at 60, it was her retirement age as a, as a sister. And she says, what am I going to do with my retirement? Well, I'm going to Egypt. I'm going to Egypt and I'm going to live in the dumpsters with the Catholics, the Christians, they're not Catholics, the Christians, the Copt, that can only live off the garbage in Cairo. And she spent years in the middle of that garbage, but she wrote books and she wrote about these people and she made these people happy. Wow. And then she would say, uh, I, when I go out, I go for a walk in the forest. And when I pray, I'm sure that some of this goes somewhere and does something good for someone. So, you know, I could go for hours on heroes. There are thousands of heroes on this planet. I would say millions of heroes. I love that. I appreciate that that viewpoint. So you've traveled quite a bit. What would you say is your favorite city? Um, well, I can tell you places I like. Uh, there's no, it can't be a favorite. My favorite city is where there's people I like. You know, mm -hmm. I, I guess you know that by now. Mm -hmm. My favorite city is this. Could be my one of my favorite cities right now. The city we just created. We create with your map behind you. We just created this other map, and we're both very we're both very happy in our little city we just created. Okay, so there's all kinds of cities. But the cities I like, uh, I would say uh, in chronological order, I'll just say like you, I have traveled a lot. Um, Berlin. Uh, Berlin was is, is a very unique city because it's in the middle of all these cultures. Uh, and in Germany, they say Berlin is like France because everyone's, no one listens to anything over there. Okay, of course, if I go in order again, I like Paris because uh, as you can see in the image, it's forbidden to build buildings inside Paris. So it's still a very flat city with 19th century, early 20th century uh, uh, buildings, and there's incredible culture. There's a city I spent days observing is Agra, because the Taj Mahal was so intriguing, had this Mughal culture that got there, and, and uh, Shah Jian, I think that uh, he had these people create the Taj Mahal, but then he cut all their hands off so they wouldn't do it somewhere else, which got me working on Uzbekistan and Tamerlan and the way they did things in, in the whole Indian culture, which is uh, something uh, I mean, fascinating. I mean, I uh, just hope people don't forget it. I mean, it's incredibly fascinating. And then I love men. Manhattan. Mm -hmm. At Manhattan, I care this. I have spent days walking in Manhattan. I was lucky enough last September to go there. And with my wife, we walked about 120 kilometers in Manhattan. It was sunny all week because you have people from all over the world there. And then uh, I could go on forever because I like everywhere I go. I like Africa. One of the cities, one of the countries I visited the most is Tunisia because I worked a lot there. I love Af Arab culture. I mean, I could, I love the, 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 the meals, the families, because uh, there's not only the cities, there's the people in those cities. And Arab culture is absolutely fascinating. I mean, Morocco, I mean, Morocco was one of my first trips as a student with my wife. Uh, of course, 
course, I travel a lot with my parents because obviously, we were, you know, military always were. So I did many countries before, but my first own trip was with my wife to Morocco and Marrakesh before it was really touristic. And I would go into the souks. These are these uh, markets. And I went deep into the markets and I felt at home in there. And I began to talk to people. Uh, I didn't speak Arab. We spoke some French and all that. And, and little by little, hey, I was adopted. I mean, uh, they would take me to the back of the shop and we'd drink tea and joke for, for hours discussing. Then they, uh, they'd go home we, with my wife. We'd been invited to their family. I'd say the best city in the world the cities, I, I can give you a model of that since, you know, I like to do representations and we can put it with the heroes. The heroes is what will bring the best out of you. And the best cities are the place where you meet people that take you away from where you live every day. Because some people travel, but they travel with themselves. They're in their bubble. Oh, I don't like the food here. It's too spicy. Why don't we eat it like at home? I say, well, why don't you go home then? Or uh, that monument's nice, but you know, it's not like in, uh, yeah, well, why don't you go back to where you came from? So it, if you travel, the word travel is you're going from A to B. So the best cities in the world is where you go from A to B, and then there's this distance, but then you feel comfortable with that distance. How can people connect with you? Where can they find you online? LinkedIn, that's the best place because right, uh, I'm only on LinkedIn. I don't go, I, I only have bots on other social media so that I use for development. LinkedIn is the best place. I always answer questions or messages. So. Yeah, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to be on the show today. Really, no, you're part of my enjoying. schedule. Oh man, no, no, I didn't take that. time off my schedule. <laughs> yeah. You were my schedule today, right on, man. I appreciate that. I think it was an interesting conversation, and um, I, I definitely learned a lot and a lot more interesting than what I originally had planned. So, thank you for that. Well, hopefully, I didn't bore you. So that's that's pretty good. No, not at all, not at all. Thanks again, and uh, uh, you're welcome back on the show at any time. Sure. Yeah. Anytime you want to talk, now that you know I can talk for hours on any subject, you can invite me all the time. I, I, the more you communicate with others, the more you express your ideas, your own ideas. Even in this conversation, you learn things, but I learn things because I express some new ideas in there. Since uh, on the piano, I'm an improviser. I, I express some details in the ideas uh, I had that I didn't have before this conversation. So uh, thank you.